A very good evening aspirants, I welcome you all to the Hindu daily news analysis brought you by Shankar Ayes Academy. Aspirants, many of you are watching our videos without subscribing to our YouTube channel. So please subscribe and hit the bell icon button to get regular updates about our content videos. Now before getting into discussion, I have an important announcement to you. The announcement is regarding prelims test series. Batch 3 of Shankar Ayes Academy's prelims test series is about to begin. The orientation for the first test will be conducted on 16th November and the first test will be conducted on 22nd November. A total of 48 tests including mock and CSAT will be provided in the test series. The test will be conducted both in online and offline mode. So go and register to the test series immediately and boost your prelim score. Now with this announcement let us get into the daily news analysis. Today I am going to cover important news articles from the Hindu newspaper dated 7th of November 2023. Displayed here is a list of news articles that we will be discussing today. At the end of the video, we will also have prelims practice question discussions. So try to watch the entire video. Now let us get into our first news article discussion. Look at this news article. The news article reports that yesterday a 7 year old boy at Valpari, Tamil Nadu was attacked by a leopard. Note that the Valpari is located within the limits of Anamalai Tiger Reserve. Okay. This is the crux of the news article given here. Now in this discussion, let us learn important points about the leopard from Purlum's perspective. First of all, know that the scientific name of the leopard is Panthera pardus. The leopard is one of the five extant species in the genus Panthera. The other four species include lion, tiger, jaguar and snow leopard. Know that leopard is a member of the cat family called Felidae. The leopard has well camouflaged fur and it possesses opportunistic hunting behavior. The leopard is known for its ability to adapt to a variety of habitats. Their habitat ranges from rainforest to steppe and it also even seen in arid and mountain areas. Okay, now with these basics let us see the distribution of leopard. The leopard is widely distributed in Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa and Southern Russia. Within India, the leopards are found in Central India, Eastern Ghats and Northeastern Hills. If you look in absolute numbers, the highest concentration of leopard in India is found in Madhya Pradesh which has approximately 3500 leopards. Madhya Pradesh is followed by Karnataka with 1800 leopards and Maharashtra with 1700 leopards. Okay, this is all about the distribution of leopard in the world and in India. Now let us see the unique characteristics of leopard. See the leopard is a solitary animal which means that leopard likes to live alone. Know that leopard is mainly nocturnal in habit that is leopards are awake and hunt at night. Leopard is a climber and it frequently stores the remains of its skills in the branches of a tree. Okay, this is about the unique features of leopard. Now let us see the threats faced by leopards. Like other wild animals, leopards are threatened by both fragmentation of the forests and decrease in the quality of forests. Apart from this, the leopards are affected by human leopard conflicts. This is because leopards are far more adaptable than tigers. So when loss of habitat takes place, they move closer to human settlements and results in the human animal conflicts. Okay, the other threats are poaching of leopards and depletion of natural prey etc. Okay, this is all about the threats faced by leopards. Now finally let us see the conservation status of the leopards. See due to its key role in the ecology, the leopards are conserved by the governments across the world. The leopards are listed as vulnerable under the IUCN red list of threatened species. Also it is placed under appendix 1 of the sites. In India the leopard is placed under schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Okay, this is all about the conservation status of leopards and that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion is all about the habitat and distribution of leopards, then we saw about the unique characteristics of leopards, then we saw about the threats faced by leopards and finally we saw some points about the conservation status of the leopards. See this topic is very much important for your prelims exam. So make note of each and every points that we discussed. Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this news article, it says that Canada is becoming a popular destination for Indian students who seek higher education. 
and the article also discusses the challenges faced by indian students in canada see recently there have been strained relations between india and canada this led to concerns about the safety of indian students in canada however canadian education institutions have reassured the safety of indian students overall the article suggests that even though canada remains a popular choice for indian students there are growing concerns about safety job prospects and housing challenges okay this is the crux of the news article given here now in this context let us discuss important aspects of india canada relations see india and canada established diplomatic relations in 1947 right after india's independence canada recognized india as a sovereign nation in the same year itself both india and canada share similarity in their constitutional features for example features in indian constitution such as federation with a strong center and a residuary powers given to the center were inspired from the canadian constitution apart from this india and canada have a long standing bilateral relationship in the areas of economy defense technology and space sectors now let us discuss them one by one first let us take economic relations see india was canada's 10th largest trading partner in 2022 india exports pharmaceuticals gem and jewelry textiles and machinery to canada while canada exports pulses timber pulp and paper and mining products to india okay regarding investments canada is the 18th largest foreign investor in india apart from this both india and canada are also engaged in negotiations for a comprehensive economic partnership agreement this agreement aims to enhance trade in goods services investment and trade facilitation okay this is all about economic relations now secondly let us look at cultural cooperation indian canada have a number of educational and cultural exchange programs and there are over 1.3 million canadians of indian origin live in canada see this is a significant aspect for soft power diplomacy of india recognizing the indian diaspora the canadian government designated april month as sikh heritage month okay this is all about cultural cooperation now thirdly let us look at nuclear cooperation in the field of nuclear cooperation the relationship between india and canada faced difficulties after india conducted a nuclear test in 1974 however in 2010 they signed a nuclear cooperation agreement which came into force in 2013 this agreement allows for civil nuclear cooperation between the india and canada in 2015 india's atomic energy regulation board signed an agreement with the canadian nuclear safety commission to exchange experiences in nuclear safety and regulatory issues okay this is all about nuclear cooperation now fourthly let us see the relations in space sector see india and canada have a history of cooperation in space related activities they collaborate on space science earth observation satellite launch services and ground support for space missions for instance isro and canadian space agency have signed agreements in the past also note that antrix which is the commercial arm of isro has launched several nano satellites from canada okay so all about the relations in space sector now lastly let us look at technology cooperation see india and canada jointly established ic impacts which is otherwise called as canada india research center for excellence it brings cooperation between canadian and indian scientists department of biotechnology under ic impacts program implements joint research projects in healthcare agri biotech and waste management then department of earth science in cooperation with canada have started scientific research on arctic studies okay this is all about the india canada relations see despite recent tensions strengthening india canada relations will require commitment and dedicated efforts from both governments by addressing challenges and pursuing mutually beneficial opportunities both countries can enhance their partnership and contribute to regional and global stability and prosperity okay and that's all regarding this discussion and this discussion is about various aspects of india canada relations now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article yesterday a retired ias officer named hira lal samaria was sworn in as the chief information commissioner of india 
see the post of the chief information commissioner had been lying vacant for the past one month so recently the supreme court asked the central government to take adequate steps to fill the vacancy in this backdrop only the vacancy of the chief information commissioner has been filled now this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us learn some important points about the central information commission the central information commission which is in short called cic was constituted in 2005 it was constituted under the right to information act 2005 so it is a statutory body the main role of the cic is to oversee the implementation of the rti act as we all know the rti act allows the citizens to assess information that is under the control of public authorities so the cic oversees this information providing process under the rti act by doing this role the cic ensures transparency and accountability in providing information to the citizens now with these basics let us see the composition of the central information commission the cic consists of a chief information commissioner and not more than 10 information commissioners both the chief information commissioner and the information commissioners are appointed by the president on the recommendation of a search com selection committee this committee consists of the prime minister leader of opposition in the lok sabha and a union cabinet minister who is nominated by the prime minister note that the prime minister acts as a chairperson of the search com selection committee this is all about the composition now moving on to say about the functions performed by cic the central information commission performs various functions under the rti act now let us see them one by one firstly the cic can receive and inquire into complaints from individuals who have been denied information by public authorities secondly the commission has authority to do an inquiry in a suo moto manner this means that the cic can conduct inquiry even without receiving any complaints while investigating the cic has the powers of a civil court thirdly the cic has powers to order public authorities to provide information to the individuals also it can review the decisions of public authorities based on the appeals filed by individuals fourthly the cic can conduct studies and research on the issues related to transparency and accountability in government it also promotes awareness of the rti act among the public and finally the cic can ask for an annual report from any public authority on complaints with the rti act apart from this the cic submits an annual report to the central government regarding the implementation of rti act the central government in turn places such reports before each house of the parliament to ensure accountability okay these are all some of the important functions performed by central information commission and that's all regarding this discussion this discussion is about the formation of cic then you saw about the composition of cic and finally we saw some points about the important functions performed by cic now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this editorial article this article talks about the controversy surrounding the regulation of over the top services in india that is the ott services here ott refers to the technology that delivers streamed content over the internet like netflix amazon prime and so on see the issue with the ott in india is that they do not share the costs of providing internet bandwidth with the internet service providers the article points out that this argument is wrong this is because the internet service providers provide access to the internet only after a consumer has paid for a data plan whereas ott platforms generate demand for internet access and they pay for content delivery networks above all these charging both consumers and content providers to pay for the internet service providers could harm the net neutrality okay this is what pointed out by the author of this editorial okay so this is the crux of this editorial given here now in this background let us solve a mains question to have a better understanding about net neutrality today's question is net neutrality is essential to provide equal access to services on the internet in the light of the above statement discuss the pros and cons of net neutrality principle 150 words 10 marks see this question can be asked in 
GS paper 3 under the topic science and technology. Now let us see how to approach this particular question. See this question is a very straightforward question. The only keyword in this question is discuss. When the keyword discuss is given, you are expected to give various perspectives of the issue and you have to present a logical argument. Okay. So this is how we are going to approach this particular question. Now let us start with introduction. Since the question is about net neutrality, in the introduction part, we have to write about what is net neutrality. Now let us see what is net neutrality. The term net neutrality was coined by Professor Tim Wu. Net neutrality is a network design principle that treats all internet traffic equally without discrimination or without giving any preference to any particular website, service or application. See, upholding the principles of net neutrality is not merely about preserving the ethos of an open internet, but it is also intrinsic to fostering a conducive environment for innovation, competition and consumer welfare. Okay, this is the definition of net neutrality. You can write these points in the introduction part. For those who don't understand what is net neutrality, let me give you an example to understand the concept better. For example, let us consider you are using internet from an internet service provider A. The internet service provider A should allow you to assess any platform that you wish to assess without any discrimination. That is, here A cannot put some data in fast lanes and block or discriminate other data. Also, A should not block you from assessing a service like Skype or slowing down Netflix in order to encourage you to buy a different video streaming service. So this principle in which all electronic communication passing through a network is treated equally is what known as net neutrality. Okay. I hope you got it. Now we shall move on to the main body of the answer. In the first part of the answer, you have to write about the pros of net neutrality principle. And in the second part of the answer, we have to write about the cons of the net neutrality principle. Now let us begin with the pros of the net neutrality principle. See there are many advantages associated with net neutrality principle. Now let us see them one by one. Firstly, the net neutrality principle protects small online based entrepreneurs from unfair competition with big internet tech chains. Net neutrality also aids startups in advertising their products and selling them openly in internet without any discrimination. Okay. Secondly, the net neutrality principle will ensure open and free internet accessible to all and it provides a level playing field. Also, it enables countless of online services including the e-commerce services. Thirdly, with net neutrality, the internet remains an open platform for innovation. It encourages development of new services, applications and technologies. This is because the innovators don't need to negotiate deals with the internet service providers to reach users. Fourthly, the net neutrality principle promotes equality of consumers by keeping the tariffs very low. Affordable tariffs will also enable increased internet penetration even in the rural areas. This also facilitates easy access to the digital public services at the grassroots level. See, it is very important to India where internet is going to be the carrier of all digital public infrastructure. And finally, net neutrality is proven to be crucial in fostering digital economy. See, digital economy has given rise to tremendous opportunities for both big tech companies and numerous tech-based startups. It has also supported gig economy, which has supported livelihood opportunities in the informal sector. Okay, so these are all some of the pros associated with net neutrality principle. So you can write these points in the first half of the answer. Now in the second part, we will see the cons of the net neutrality principle. See, there are many disadvantages associated with net neutrality principle. Let us see them one by one. Firstly, since all traffic is treated equally, net neutrality can lead to network congestion. So it will be more challenging for internet service providers to manage traffic efficiently during peak usage times. Secondly, net neutrality discourages investment in broadband infrastructure. Internet service providers may be less motivated to upgrade their networks if they can't charge content providers for faster delivery. 
This may result in less access to internet and high costs for consumers. Thirdly, net neutrality can lead to over use of bandwidth by data intensive services like video streaming. Internet service providers may struggle to keep up with the demand for high quality streaming without being able to charge content providers for faster access. Fourthly, implementing and monitoring net neutrality regulations can be costly for governments and internet service providers. These costs may be passed on to the consumers in the form of high service fees. Okay, so these are all some of the cons associated with net neutrality principle. Okay, so you can write these points in the second part of the answer. Having completed the body part, let us see the conclusion. See in the conclusion part, you can write that the schemes like Digital India aims to transform India into a digitally empowered society and knowledge economy. This aim cannot be achieved without the impetus of the principle of net neutrality. So all stakeholders including policy makers should focus on long term efforts in making the internet open to all. Okay. So this can be a balanced conclusion for this question. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, through a means answer writing approach, we saw what is net neutrality. Then we saw about the pros and cons associated with net neutrality principle. Now with these points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this news article. This news article talks about the Financial Action Task Force, that is FATF. See the FATF's periodic review of India's performance has begun now. In this backdrop, few human rights activists and non-profit organizations has written a letter to the FATF. They said that the Indian government is prosecuting and harassing activists and NGOs on the pretext of countering terrorist financing. So this is the crux of the news article given here. Now in this context, let us learn important facts about FATF. The Financial Action Task Force, which is in short called as FATF, is the global money laundering and terrorist financing watchdog. It was established in 1989 during the G7 summit in Paris. Initially, its objective was to examine and develop measures to combat money laundering. But following the 9-11 attacks on the United States, the FATF expanded its mandate to include efforts to combat terrorist financing. Apart from this, the FATF also works to stop funding for weapons of mass destruction. Okay, this is the basics about FATF. Now talking about the working of the FATF, the FATF sets international standards to prevent the illegal activities and harms of money laundering and terrorist financing. And as a policy making body, the FATF also works to generate the political will that is needed to bring in more national legislative and regulatory reforms in money laundering and terrorist financing areas. In this manner, in April 1990, the FATF issued a report containing a set of 40 recommendations. These recommendations provided a comprehensive plan of action that is required to fight money laundering. Later in 2004, the FATF published a nine special recommendations. This further strengthened the previously established international standards for combating money laundering and terrorist financing. From then, these recommendations were known as the 40 plus 9 recommendations. Okay. Later in 2012, the FATF revised its recommendations and expanded them to deal with new threats like the financing of proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Okay. These are about the working areas of the FATF. Now talking about the jurisdiction, the FATF currently has over 200 jurisdictions around the world. All the jurisdictions have committed to FATF recommendations through a global network of nine FATF style regional bodies and FATF memberships. To identify the non-complying countries, FATF maintains the FATF blacklist or the call for action countries and the FATF grey list or the other monitored jurisdictions. See these lists are maintained since 2000. Okay, This is all about the jurisdiction of FATF. Now coming to the sessions of the FATF, the FATF plenary is the decision making body of the FATF. So during its plenary sessions, the FATF considers mutual evaluation reports, policy and governance matters. The FATF plenary meets three times per year. Apart from this, they meet once a year at an annual typologist workshop. The FATF also meets 
out of session for a variety of purposes including private sector consultation meetings okay this is all about the sessions of the fatf now finally let us see the membership of the fatf as of today the fatf comprises 38 member countries representing most major financial centers in all parts of the globe out of 38 members there are two regional organizations such as the european commission and the gulf cooperation council note that in last february russia was suspended from the fatf due to war with ukraine okay see the member countries of fatf are displayed here you can go through it now coming to india specific points india joined the fatf with observer status in 2006 later it became a full member of the fatf in 2010 note that india is also a member of fatf regional partners such as the asia pacific group and the eurasian group okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion is about the various aspects of financial action task force that is the fatf now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article recently our navy chief admiral mr hari kumar spoke about the indo pacific maritime domain awareness that is ipmda initiative know that the ipmda initiative was announced by the quad grouping the admiral said that the ipmda initiative reinforces india's commitment to free open inclusive and rule based indo pacific okay this is the crux of the news article given here now in this discussion let us learn important points about the quad group and about the ipmda initiative now first let us take quad the quad stands for quadrilateral security dialogue the quad is an informal strategic dialogue forum it comprises four countries namely us india australia and japan the main aim of the quad is to ensure a free open and prosperous indo-pacific region the quad grouping was institutionalized in 2007 since its formation the quad has been dormant for many years however in 2021 the leaders of the quad group met virtually and they discussed about their objectives after discussion they released a joint statement titled the spirit of the quad it outlines the objectives of the quad group now coming to the objectives the main objectives of the quad are ensuring maritime security then addressing the risks of climate change then creating an ecosystem for investment in the indo pacific region and boosting technological innovation this is all about the objectives of quad see to meet the objective of maritime security the quad announced the ipmda initiative now let us see about the ipmda initiative the ipmda stands for indo pacific maritime domain awareness this initiative was announced last year at the quad leader summit the initiative aims to strengthen peace stability and prosperity of the indo pacific region it also aims to bring increased transparency in critical waterways of the indo pacific region the ipmda initiative also aims to use innovative technology such as satellite based data collection this will help the quad group to get near real time information on activities occurring in their respective maritime zones okay now with these basics let us see the working areas of the ipmda initiative firstly the ipmda initiative aims to track dark shipping see dark shipping is a term used to describe a ship which turns off its automatic identification system while operating at the sea note that the automatic identification system is a transponder system the system will transmit identification data of ships like the position of the ship at sea to the maritime authorities this help the authorities to track ships at the sea see there is a continuous occurrence of dog shipping in the indo pacific region which results in many illegal activities like drug trafficking human trafficking terrorism and so on so the ipmda initiative aims to track such dog shipping this in turn helps to ensure maritime security in the indo pacific region okay this is the first main working area of the ipmda initiative secondly the ipmda initiative aims to build a faster wider and more accurate maritime picture of a near real time activities in partners waters to put it simply the ipmda initiative aims to track any suspicious activities in the 
coasts of partner countries. It aims to achieve such an objective by integrating three critical regions in the Indo-Pacific region such as Pacific Islands, Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean region. Okay. Thirdly, the IPMDA initiative will bring cooperation in various areas like tracking the activities of the enemies like secret meetings at sea, then improving partners ability to respond to climate and humanitarian events etc. Fourthly, the IPMDA initiative will help quad countries as well as other littoral states in the Indo-Pacific region to combat the expanding Chinese naval presence across the region. And finally, the IPMDA initiative helps the countries to work with regional information fusion center in the Indo-Pacific region. This helps in sharing vital data about any maritime issue in the Indo-Pacific region. Okay. So these are all the working areas of IPMDA initiative. And that's all regarding this discussion. This discussion is about the basics of Quad Group. Then we saw about IPMDA initiative. That is the Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness Initiative. Then we saw about the working areas of the IPMDA initiative. Now with these points in mind, let us move on to the next part of the video. That is to discuss preliminary practice questions. As friends, today we are having three questions. Let us solve them one by one. Look at the first question. This question is regarding leopards. Here three statements are given. We have to find how many of the statements are correct. Look at the first statement. They are social animals like lions. See this statement is incorrect. Leopards are solitary animal where they like to live alone. Whereas lions are social animal where they like to live in groups. So first statement is incorrect. Now coming to the second statement. The spots of leopards are called rosettes as they resemble the shape of arrows. See this statement is correct. Now coming to the third statement, Maharashtra has the largest population of leopards in India. See this statement is incorrect. Karnataka has the largest population of leopards in India and not Maharashtra. So third statement is incorrect. Here only second statement is correct. So the correct answer for the question is option A only one. Moving on, let's take up the second question. This question is regarding Central Information Commission. Look at the first statement. It is a statutory body. See, this statement is correct. The Central Information Commission is a statutory body which was established under the Right to Information Act 2005. So, first statement is correct. Now, coming to the second statement, it lacks pseudo-motor power to conduct inquiry. See, this statement is incorrect. As we saw in the discussion, the Central Information Commission has CO motor power to conduct inquiry. So second statement is incorrect. Now coming to the third statement, it can hear appeals from the individuals who have denied information from public authorities. See this statement is correct. It is one of the functions of Central Information Commission. Here first and third statements are correct. So the correct answer for the question is option B only two. Moving on, let's take up the final question. This question is regarding quad grouping. Here also three statements are given. We have to find how many of the statements are correct. Look at the first statement. It is a strategic alliance between USA, Japan, India and Australia. See this statement is incorrect. Here the countries are correct. But it is not a strategic alliance. Rather it is a strategic dialogue forum. Okay. Please note the difference. So first statement is incorrect. Now coming to the second statement. The headquarters of Quad is located in New York. See this statement is incorrect. There is no headquarters for quad grouping. Now coming to the third statement. The Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness that is the IPMDA is an initiative of the quad. See this statement is correct. As we saw in the discussion last year the quad announced the IPMDA initiative. So third statement is correct. Here only one statement is correct. So the correct answer for the question is option A only one. Displayed here is a means practice question for you today. Go through the question, write your answer and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of the video. If you found our video to be useful, do like, comment and share it with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe Shankaraya's Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.